Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is John Lindsay Poland, and I work for the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And I want to welcome you to the third uh, webinar of Militarism Watch. And um, uh, the first two were on uh, using official sources and on using the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, and we will have another one uh, next month uh, about uh, researching military contracts. And today I am um, very delighted um, uh, to have with us uh, Cynthia Enloe and Gwyn Kirk, uh, who are longtime scholars and activists, uh, to present the webinar, Where are the Women Feminist Research of U.S. Militarism? A couple housekeeping things first. Um, if you um, want to say something, you can uh, put something into the, in the chat box, uh, which you can open from the green bar at the top of your screen. Um, and uh, you can also uh, send us any kind of uh, technical messages as well. Uh, we hope to uh, hear from uh, Cynthia and Gwen and then have some time for conversation. Uh, Cynthia has uh, been uh, writing about uh, militarism and feminism and the role of gender in US militarism for uh, several decades, uh, has written 12 books and uh, is, is well known uh, on the subject. Uh, she teaches at Clark University. Gwen um, has, uh, is one of the co-founders of an organization called Women for Genuine Security, uh, which she will talk a little bit more about. And um, I've had the um, great pleasure of collaborating with both of them. So uh, we're gonna hear from Cynthia first. And uh, Cynthia, um, uh, let us know what you wanna say. Hi, John. Hi, Gwen. Um, and hi, everybody who's taking part. It's really such a treat. Um, I feel very much part of the 21st century um, being part of this webinar. Um, over the years, Gwen and I have had many conversations. Um, we're longtime uh, collaborators, and I always learn from Gwen way back from when she was one of the key participants in the women's peace camp at Greenham Common in the UK. Um, and what both of us have found over the years is that we've figured, we've got to figure out, that is all of us together, um, have to figure out why militaristic ideas, why militaristic culture, why militaristic presumptions um, and practices, why they have such a foothold, why they're so entrenched and woven into the very fabric of American life, not just American high culture, but American daily life. And that's one of the things that I think we need a lot more people doing feminist-inspired research on in their own communities, in their own lives. And one of the first images that comes to my mind when I think about this, when I think about this puzzle, because these are all puzzles that I think we need a lot more investigation into, and that's where I'm looking for all of you to do the investigations um, and tell the rest of us. And this image is now quite a normal one, I'm afraid. Normal always in quotes. And it's of American military jet fighter planes. Uh, these are not just entertainment vehicles. These are weapons. And they're flying over a... Um, American sports stadium, and probably a number of you have been at football games or baseball games, usually male sports. Very rarely will you have what are called flyovers, these military jet um, overpasses. Rarely will you have them over a women's tennis game or over a women's volleyball match. You will have them over big-time male professional sports, but of course women and men are both in the stadium and looking up and oftentimes find these entertaining um, as if it adds excitement to the football game or as if it adds um, kind of a buzz to what is already a competitive sport. And I wonder about that. I wonder about it a lot. I'm a Red Sox fan. Um, and when I'm at Fenway Park, which is a wonderful baseball park uh, here in Boston, there are military flyovers, even here in Massachusetts, and I kind of look around at all my fellow Red Sox fans, all my fellow civilian sports um, attendees, and wonder why do they find this 
entertaining? Why do they find it exciting? Now, I probably did too, you know, 20 years ago, but now this is really a source of puzzlement for me. And so I think it's one of the places to start with your own feminist-inspired investigations. Do you know anybody, including yourself? Uh, always ask yourself the same questions you're asking everybody else. That's always a feminist strategy for investigation. Why do you, why do I, why do other civilians find it normal to have essentially military uh, destructive weapons um, flying over a civilian sports event? Why is it not considered an act of militarism, but rather an act of entertainment? So that's one place to start your investigations. Uh, and again, think of asking yourself. Now, when you come to a second sort of Unfortunately, everyday um, image that we see here in the United States, um, and that is of a junior ROTC, um, that's a Defense Department Cadet Corps, um, uh, marching in a schoolyard or at a, a public event where the schools are taking part. Um, it raises questions about why so many American high schools now have um, voted uh, locally to ask the Defense Department to set up um, cadet corps, military cadet corps, in their civilian high schools. The image um, you'll see here, which I think those of you who are from Texas will recognize that as the Texas flag, um, this I believe is not a, an official ROTC Defense Department Cadet Corps, but it is another military cadet corps. Um, in Texas, there are also non-national military cadet corps in schools. Um, but in many of your own communities, and certainly in many of the communities around where I live, um, the local school boards have voted to ask the Defense Department to come in and set up cadet corps. And here's another site for local feminist investigation, and that is to ask mothers um, why they, or if they think it's good um, to have the military in their schools. But again, being a feminist or being feminist in the way you do your investigations, you have to do it respectfully. You can't I mean, I don't think any of you would do this, but you have to kind of really watch yourself and make sure you don't come across in any way as if you have superior knowledge and somehow you are more politically conscious than the people you're talking to. You really have to think about are there are junior ROTC units in the schools around you and have you ever noticed? Have you ever questioned them? Um, one of the other things to look for is and to ask parents about and to ask girls and boys in high school about um, is whether the ROTC units are oftentimes delegated by the civilian school principal um, to take a lead in certain kinds of events. For instance, I know from a friend of mine in Delaware that she became very alarmed when in her son's high school, it was the junior ROTC students uh, who were given the task or the privilege they saw it as of raising the American flag at local school events. And I thought, and she thought, isn't that odd? Why should a student in the junior ROTC be thought to be more capable or more appropriate for raising the national flag? The national flag is not a military symbol. It's supposed to be a symbol of American uh, unity. Uh, and why should children, because ROTC officially is made up of children, junior ROTC, that is below the age of 18, why should they be raising the national flag rather than the members of the chess club or the members of the girls' volleyball team? Um, so there's another site to do some wondering, to do some self-investigating, and um, some do some digging and find out how this level of militarization has crept into our civilian schools. The Defense Department these days considers the junior ROTC program, which is meant for teenagers uh, below the age of 18. Uh, the Defense Department now considers this one of the most successful of all their programs. 
And of course, it militarizes high schools, and it militarizes parents, and it militarizes students. Um, and one needs to find out why do so many parents and maybe teachers and principals, um, not to mention children themselves, why do they find it so satisfying or so, such a source of, of pride or even security? So there's another field for local investigating, again, starting with yourself. Um, we have to be really humble as feminist investigators, and that means really curious about our own assumptions. And that means asking about things that we used to not see as odd, and now we do, and to think back of why didn't we see those things as odd. Looking at a third um, image, and this is one that um, I took a photograph of when I was in Geneva last September. This is a stunning, an absolutely stunning public sculpture. When you're looking at it, it's hard to get the perspective on it, the proportions, but you'll see um, a bus and a van there on the Geneva street, so you can kind of get a sense of how tall this is. This sculpture is about two stories tall. It sits um, in an open public plaza just across from one of the big United Nations buildings in Geneva. You'll see that it's missing, or missing half of, its fourth leg. And this is a memorial um, built to commemorate all the people who have been injured or killed by landmines. And it was built as part and parcel of the international campaign um, to win support for the treaty, the international treaty, that governments sign to ban landmines. Now, you may know about this, but uh, maybe not, and that is that the American government, along with the Chinese government, the Sudanese government, and the Russian government, as well as several others, the South Korean government, the North Korean government, um, have refused to ratify the anti-landmines treaty. So when I look at this really moving uh, memorial, it makes me wonder why have so many Americans, not all, but why have so many Americans gone along with our government's refusal to sign this anti-landmine treaty? What is there about American culture today, and that means all of us, all our assumptions, what we think of as makes us secure, for instance, that has allowed us to be so passive in the face of our government's refusal, and by that I mean both Republican and Democratic administrations as well as majorities in the Senate, uh, refusal to, to sign this seemingly very humane um, treaty banning one of the worst of all weapons because the landmines stay in the ground unseen, unsuspected, for years after any uh, ceasefire is uh, signed, and it means that children and men and women, especially farmers out in fields, um, are the ones who lose their limbs or lose their lives um, because of the long-term dangers of landmines that sit out in the countryside. The last image that I think provokes some chances for local and very personal investigations. Looks like a very happy picture. It's a picture of civilian young women, maybe college uh, young women, um, dressed in the height of fashion, which is what the fashion industry would like us to call camo. But it's in fact military camouflage, which now has taken off, not just in the US, but in Japan and in Korea and a lot of other countries as a form of young people's fashion. Some adults will wear it too, but I don't mean um, veterans wearing bits and pieces of their military uniform. These are um, bits of clothing that are sold at high fashion stores like The Gap. And we need to know more about why people um, both as parents who buy clothes um, and as young adults who maybe have some spending money to buy 
clothes on their own, why do they think it's fashionable to wear military outfits? Because camouflage, of course, is created so that you stay invisible as a soldier so that you either won't be able to um, be seen by the enemy or you will stay hidden so that you can fire your weapon at another um, person. And I don't think these four young women um, probably think that they're engaging with enemies, but they are normalizing, I think, um, the camouflage um, military outfit, which is a form of weaponry in a funny kind of way, um, in a way that makes militarism just that much more invisible in American daily culture. So when you do feminist investigations, what you can do is, first of all, look at your own closet. <laughs> um, look, Ask everybody to look at their own closets um, and talk to people about what do you find um, easy about buying or wearing camouflage. As a, a feminist, I, I've said this and Gwen will say it in other ways too, I'm sure, and that is that as a feminist, you really have to assume that you're complicit too, that you've got to um, not assume that you or I are already conscious or already um, of high consciousness around these things. And so it's oftentimes a good idea to keep a log, maybe if you're in a little group or even just yourself, keep a log for two weeks. And just chart every time during the day you find yourself either not noticing, and then you catch yourself because you're not noticing, um, or you see something in the culture that really is militarized that you've never really thought about before. And see and exchange your own logs and with each other and see how militarism works in your own daily and community lives because that's what allows American governments – um, of all parties, to boost the defense um, budget, to engage in invasions, to have U.S. military bases um, in other people's countries around the world. It is our unthinkingness, I think. And so to do feminist investigation has two effects. One, we gain knowledge. That's always a good thing. And two, we raise our own consciousness about what we've never noticed before. I, I'm a keen believer in feminist investigations because it makes us smarter in both senses, both in the sense that we become more aware of our own roles in militarism, but also we learn more about our fellow citizens and why they've come to take um, militarism as either positive or just normal. Great. Well, thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, that really uh, lays out a kind of a whole approach to uh, not just militarism, but to our own experience uh, more broadly. And kind of, uh, so we'll, we'll have some conversation about that in a moment. Um, so I want to turn it over to Gwen now. And um, uh, Gwen will be talking a bit more about her own experience in applying some of these kinds of approaches. Thank you, John. Thank you, Cynthia. It's great to uh, hear you share your thoughts again. Um, I'm just uh, trying to move the slides forward. There we go. Uh, as John said earlier, I've been involved in a group called Women for Genuine Security, uh, mainly based in the Bay Area, and also working with women from uh, different parts of the Asia-Pacific region. It's this slide from uh, South Korea. Uh, where women are involved uh, with men and uh, both in the community and from all over the country in opposing a new Navy base that's being built uh, right now on uh, Jeju Island in the southern part of Korea. Um, much of the work I've been doing has been focused on bases overseas. As Cynthia said, I first of all came to this country from Britain uh, years ago. and. Uh, having discovered, I think, to my shock, how many bases there were, you know, in our country um, that were flying the United States flag inside and uh, people were buying Hershey bars and Lucky Strikes 
in the PX stores, um, you know, I got interested in how um, many U.S. bases there are around the world, uh, roughly about a thousand, and so those um, assumptions and um, you know, ideas that many people have about militarism and its necessity really feed in directly uh, to the work of our network. And I took on um, writing and doing some research about three issues that arose out of our network uh, conversations. One concerning violence against women uh, committed by military people uh, in the A Asia Pacific region. Uh, another one concerning treaties and agreements between our countries that govern, uh, you know, regulations that govern U.S. military presence in those places, and also um, something on environmental contamination and the health effects. So the activists I'm working with are very much concerned to expose what in their view is really a lie about so-called military security, arguing that uh, militarism actually jeopardizes their everyday security. Um, we are placed in really different locations in this network, South Korea, Okinawa, mainland Japan, uh, Guam, Philippines, Hawaii, uh, West Coast United States, and there are many differences obviously of language, of culture, uh, and history with some complex um, interrelationships amongst our countries. Uh, the domination of Japan, for example, in many of those countries, the domination of the United States. But we've tried to define for ourselves what uh, Chandra Mahanti calls a common context of struggle. Uh, so although we see things from different viewpoints, um, we're all asking similar questions about what's the role of militarism in our lives. And uh, Cynthia often uses the phrase, curiosity, having a feminist curiosity. So I partly included that slide, you know, to remind <laughs> us of that. And uh, this uh, very cute baby trying out something that, you know, as adults we kind of have forgotten how to ask those questions that in a way seem a little, quote, dumb or disingenuous. But I think that's also part of what we're doing is questioning, you know, assumptions that you don't sit in the part. Uh, a key part of my methodology also concerns listening, really a kind of careful, deep listening. And I'm listening for uh, people's assumptions, their definitions, where the stories start, um, listening for their hopes and intentions, what people want to know. I try to remind myself that I need to keep listening, even if I think I've heard the story before. Um, there's invariably something new in different tellings, and there's always something new to learn. Although sometimes my impatient side is saying, okay, I've already heard this, um, but usually there's something new. Uh, a part of it, of course, is getting yourself in situations where you can hear people's stories. And that might mean physically traveling, but it could mean going to a meeting across town. It could mean uh, looking on a website or seeing a movie uh, where you can hear other people's perspectives. The more you listen, I think, the more you're able to hear. And that's really part of the fascination of this for me. So um, getting the details of a particular situation, I, I'm you know, I want to ask a lot of questions. This young woman is protesting the conversion of rice farms into uh, a military base uh, south of Seoul uh, in the area called Pyeongtaek several years ago. So I was curious about who she is, what does it mean in this context that she's young, what are her ideas about militarism, how is her life shaped by the military presence in South Korea, U.S. presence. Why is she participating in this process, this, this protest? And what are her hopes, both for herself, her future, and for the future of the country? Partly, I'm looking at these details and then gradually figuring out how they fit into, um, uh, you know, a wider picture. These are names commemorating people who were killed in a massacre 
that happened on Jeju Island uh, just after World War II. Um, magnified here on this screen and if you can imagine this memorial actually is magnified many times more. This is just one screen um, out of several. I'm listening also for details about gender and race and class and nation. It's like having a flashlight that will illuminate those different factors and of course they overlap. Uh, so in a way you have a handful of flashlights that allow you to see the whole picture. So for example, at Jeju, um, the village women are a very strong presence in the community gatherings, even though the men are more vocal at the decision-making meetings, people told me. Um, it's a beautiful place. It's warm. It's a tourist destination. People grow tangerines and other citrus crops. The new Navy base there will house Aegis destroyers, supposedly there to patrol the shipping lane south of Korea. Uh, where China ships most of its oil. And ironically, most of the tourists these days to Jeju are from China. So there's a little complexity about the way the national level plays out in this particular struggle. All the signs say that this construction is a Korean Navy base, but the Aegis destroyers are being built at Bath Ironworks in Maine. So people are asking, what is the role of the United States uh, you know, in this particular situation, it seems to be um, a shadowy figure in the background. And the more, you know, activists and researchers dig into that, uh, they find the ways in which the, the U.S. is actually intimately connected, although not so visible up front. I'm also interested in the way this, uh, you know, starting with individual stories, we can kind of build up to a much bigger picture that has both community and macro and global levels to it. Uh, of course, individuals emphasize the personal, the way they're personally affected uh, by a base uh, or the plan to, you know, uh, build a base in their backyard. Uh, for example, um, women from the Philippines who are working in bars alongside U.S. bases, when they talk about, you know, the circumstances of their work, often emphasize the fact that they were lied to by agents who recruited them in the Philippines. Um, then they complain about their managers who are often mean and keep them under very uh, close uh, scrutiny, as, and as well as the bar owners, you know, who are really in it for making money. Um, and those people, of course, define the women's working lives. But their work is also organized in this much wider context. And this is where the macro and global level factors come in. So that can include the relationship between, you know, the Korean government and the United States government, uh, Pentagon policies and regulations, and the assumptions that both governments share that U.S. soldiers need access to women. Uh, the poverty, uh, impoverishment, I should say, of the Philippines, you know, as a former United States colony, of course, is part of that. Uh, without decent paying jobs back home, uh, many Filipinos are forced overseas to work in a range of industries, including this one. So I'm listening for patterns. Um, what things seem to tell a consistent story and which stories seem to be rather unique, maybe even outliers. Uh, and then I'm also listening for um, uh, how did this happen? What's the kind of history of these particular situations? You know, what is it in the relationships between our governments, you know, that allow, for example, this U.S. Marine space I believe the only marine space outside mainland United States to be located here in the middle of Okinawa. Um, what is the history of, you know, colonization or war or takeover uh, that allows this to happen? And what are the um, relationships between, you know, people who live around the base and people who live inside it? So what's outside the frame? And this kind of leads me to think more about how this analysis and this thing is layered. Um, I find a big challenge is knowing when you've heard enough or learned enough to say something accurate and meaningful. 
for example, when I got back from Jeju last fall, uh, where I was just able to uh, visit for a few days, uh, I was overwhelmed by how little I knew about all the background to that situation. And basically, I put almost everything on hold and just read uh, what I could find of Korean history, particularly history of that massacre on Jeju uh, at the end of World War II and you know various human rights violations, and what it was in the history and culture that gave people from Jeju um, the strength and courage and sense of identity that they can stand up to this um, you know military base that's, that's being planned there. Um, one last point I'd make is about reciprocity. I think this is a really important element of research, um, whether it's a more activist-related research that I do, or maybe a more academic kind of research. Activists give very precious time uh, to talk to researchers, and there's some expectation, I think, or maybe a hope, often not made it at all explicit, that there would be something for them that will come out of this process. So. Um, I want to encourage people to, you know, always be asking how we can help, uh, what it is that uh, women or men we're um, working with want to know. Um, it seems obvious to say this, uh, but uh, not everybody does it, and that's to send copies of the work you do, you know, whether it's a radio show or a DVD um, or a report. Uh, sometimes people say, you know, many people come here and they ask us lots of questions, and then we never hear from them again. Uh, or our situation doesn't change. So that's one reason why I think reciprocity is important. So I think there are lots of ways that one can do this depending on, you know, one's different circumstances, situations. Um, helping to create opportunities for women to speak for themselves has been one that I've tried to do, you know, arranging speaking tours or visits. Um, also been part of uh, making a movie, Living Along the Fence Line, that tells sev seven women's stories. Um, sometimes uh, we write together. Um, I may start that um, writing project, you know, after a long conversation, might write the first draft and then send it back for, you know, people locally in Guam, for example, or Korea to uh, do the next part. Um, publishing joint work or perhaps editing their materials in English uh, to make them seem a little more authoritative, you know, to people who are uh, first language English speakers. Um, within our network, we try to recognize each other as partners, thinking of each other when we hear of opportunities for funding or nominating people for awards so that they get the recognition that they deserve. and. Uh, also, if you look at our website, uh, Women for Genuine Security website, uh, you'll notice that we sell bags made from recycled juice cartons by women of the Buklod Center in the Philippines. Uh, it's a small thing um, supporting their fundraising efforts, but I think an important part of reciprocity. So um, I want to thank everybody who's uh, you know, been listening and looking forward to uh, hearing questions. Thank you to Cynthia for all your work and the ways you've kept going with this. In fact, you know, you've really opened this whole field uh, as a, an area for many people to study and research. And thank you, John, for um, initiating Militarism Watch and encouraging more people to research this topic and um, helping us by, you know, helping to develop our skills and also to kind of develop a network of folks who are interested in, and concerned about this issue and realize that, um, you know, there's a lot to investigate. Well, uh, thank you, Gwyn. And, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just going to ask a couple questions and hope that the two of you will uh, reflect a little bit more. Um, Gwy uh, Cynthia, are you still on the line? I'm on the line. I should say, though, that I've lost the visual entirely, about two-thirds through Gwen's presentation. She presents so well, I could picture what she was saying, but my visual is gone. But if you can hear me, um, we can still take part in the conversation. Okay, great. So uh, my first question is, I guess, for, for both of you, and um, it has to do a little bit with um, how you, uh, you, know, you, you both talked about questioning the assumptions. 
And um, that, that seems to me so fundamental to being able to open up uh, one's own investigation. Um, I suspect that a lot of people who are listening to this um, have some awareness already of how m militarism has infiltrated or pervaded our lives. And um, I, I guess I, I'd like to ask a little bit about how what your experiences or insights about uh, bringing that questioning of assumption to others. Um, but, you know, you talked about, you know, you question your assumptions and then you reciprocate. So you you have partners that you're working with, Gwen. Um, and, and Cynthia, you talked uh, particularly about um, keeping a log and being self-aware in that sense. Um, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about any experiences you have about opening those assumptions up with one's uh, uh, coworkers or other activists or uh, researchers or family members in a way that might result in some kind of uh, action. Well, I, this is Cynthia. I, I guess one thing that I've found is that I'm never self-aware enough. It always takes, as they say, a village. And so I find that I can't examine my own assumptions all by my lonesome. I really need to do it in uh, a group. And the group doesn't have to be an organized group. It really can be a group of friends, or it can be a group of family members, or as you say, some workmates. And it can be in, it doesn't have to be in a highly structured kind of setting. Oftentimes when I have some of the best conversations about, do you think, you know, there's anything militarized in our uh, daily lives? Um, people will raise things that I have not noticed at all. And here, you know, I supposedly spend a lot of time thinking about this, but they will say, I remember I was talking with a group of students and I asked them um, if they could spend several weeks just finding something they thought was militarized and talking about it. They didn't have to decide that it was thoroughly, but they at least had to start with the question of, I have a hunch that that's militarized. I wonder if it is when I think about it more. And one of the things that I was so struck by is one of the students who is a very enthusiastic gymnast, and she said, she came back and talked about how militarized she thought a girl's local gymnastics class was. And she wasn't talking about them doing, you know, being trained for military attack or um, wearing military outfits or anything, but she just found and she began to describe how disciplined it was, how many patriotic symbols there seemed to be pervading the class, um, how the ideas about what girls do and what boys do seem so prominent. And I thought, wow, I've never thought of a girl's gymnastics class as having any relationship to militarism. Um, and, of course, it wasn't as militarized as, say, the junior ROTC in the local high school, but it certainly had aspects that I had never thought of. So I think talking these things out really openly as if you're all on a kind of sleuthing project together with nobody having full knowledge is very much the spirit in which to do this. And other people can say, oh, but patriotism isn't the same as militarism, and then you can have a really good conversation about that. Yeah. So did this uh, uh, gymnast, did she uh, act on her new awareness? Yes. In fact, she um, began to talk to the coach and to the parents, because this was a class for young girls, and she, the woman who was doing it was herself maybe 20, and she said that she had never noticed how militarized in her terms it was. And she began talking to parents and other older gymnasts, older meaning early 20s, um, and even the coach and saying, do we have to have all this um, kind of regimented uh, uh, culture infusing our gymnastics sport? It was very interesting. Yeah. Gwen, is there something you think of? That's a great, um, a great example, Cynthia. Thank you. You know, I was just thinking also, um, I think it is essential to talk with other people. 
because that's the way you know what your assumptions are. Otherwise, they're so internal. They're, I think, really just kind of, um, you know, very implicit. Um, so um, I've been in several wonderful sessions, actually, with our group, Women for Genuine Security, which is, um, um, you know, has people from really different backgrounds, many Asia-Pacific ancestry. Um, and we've gone around and answered the question, um, you know, am I connected to militarism or how am I connected to militarism or what does, you know, has militarism shaped my life? And uh, people have told uh, all kinds of stories about, you know, their grandparents or people who were able to come to this country because some member of the family, you know, served in the military and so was able to get citizenship or at least a green card initially. Uh, people whose parents, you know, met um, as a result of uh, one person being based, you know, in a particular community. And listening to other people's stories of, uh, really helps you, I think, you know, think more about your own and how your own experience, uh, you know, is such an important thing that shapes, you know, your own sense of what matters and what's important. And, you know, to use that word you said earlier, you know, what seems natural or what's naturalized for you. Yeah, that's great. We can't we can't do this by ourselves, can we? Um, Never. That's the good news, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I suppose part of that means also then breaking through the isolation to talking about these things, because uh, in some in some people's lives, it's uh, not something you're supposed to talk about. You know, you're. Uh, it's it's not part of the, the ordinary conversations that you know, my partner has with his mother or that some people have with their with their workmates. Yeah, no, uh, I think that's true. And I think particularly that's how you can tell what a militarized society uh, the United States has become. Um, and by the way, some other societies too. I mean, Gwen works with a lot of South Koreans and South Korean feminists talk about how militarized rituals and militarized relationships have permeated their lives too, partly as a result of the alliance with the U.S., but also some internal dynamics in South Korea as well. And I think it is hard, and one, time, one has to find language. For instance, if this is kind of a new topic to whoever you're talking with, it's probably not good to start with militarism or militarization, It's because um, it, that sounds very – I mean, we use it now because it's a very useful set of terms. It helps us, as Gwen said, shine a flashlight and see things. But to a lot of people for whom that kind of um, terminology is new, it sounds very ideological and is off-putting right at the start. So it's much better to use very specific examples and say, you know, to talk about how people came to this country as new immigrants through perhaps – participation in a mili the U.S. military, or what do you think about those flyovers over a football game? Things very specific that doesn't immediately go to the abstract. Mm -hmm. So I have a um, another question for, for each of you, um, and that is um, about – uh, you, you know, Gwen, you talked a bit about uh, your work with folks, uh, some of which has required some travel. And um, and Cynthia, you talked about uh, that kind of set sense of inquiry in one's uh, immediate surroundings and or and life. And I'm wondering um, if if uh, if I were going to uh, investigate, uh, you know, if I'm really upset by the U.S. war in Afghanistan, or um, uh, the fact that um, the United States is developing more drones uh, to kind of depersonalize the bombing of civilian populations. Um, how would you use this, all the different kinds of uh, approaches that you've talked about uh, to try to investigate something with an eye towards activism, an eye and ear towards activism, but that is not necessarily part of one's daily life nor might we have the opportunity to go and see see what it how it uh, um, uh, acts out, how it gets played out uh, someplace that might be far from us. 
Well, one of the things that strikes me, John, about drones is that they're highly technologically sophisticated. And so for a lot of people, and I think especially for a lot of women, um, not only in this culture but other cultures too, things as they become more technological, they're thought to be more the arena for men to talk as if they knew. They don't know either, by the way, but um, they feel more confident in talking about things they don't know about technologically. But certainly for a lot of women, not all women, but for a lot of women, that's sort of a no-go zone. Uh, it's where, you know, you're supposedly too naive or too unsophisticated um, or too untutored to talk. But if you actually start talking about why, what do you think when you hear about a drone strike? Because now, I mean, when you think about it, what's interesting is that we can all talk about drones and kind of have an idea of what they are, which is pretty interesting. It's become part of American culture now to be able to talk about this very exotic um, weaponry called the drone. And most of us have started to take them as normal. We, if somebody makes a joke, as President Obama did um, once about if any boy dates his girls, you know, he better look out because he, you know, controls the drones. And it, everyone laughed, and it was an amusing moment. But most of us know, assume now we know what a drone is, and yet we've all become maybe blasé, or at least we've normalized them, and that's a really important part of the power of the drone is they are now thought to be as normal as any other kind of ordinary, not necessarily good, but ordinary weaponry. And that normalization of the drone is something all of us are experts in because we are the ones who are normalizing it. And that you can have really good conversations about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's a good question, John, you know, um, how you find out about things that you're just beginning to learn about. And, uh, you know, in the past, uh, Cynthia, you've talked a lot about uh, um, advantages these days of the web. And I just want to, you know, talk about that just a little bit. Um, the fact that we can Google a whole range of things means that uh, we can get in touch, I think, with organizations that are doing work around particular issues. You know, organizations that may be in our town, uh, often are not in our town, but there's so much information out there that, um, I'm, you know, I think some things are getting more, I'm going to use a military term if you like, below the radar. Um, you know, some things are, it's less easy to talk about, and in another way, there's actually a lot of information available. And so, um, one thing I would do if I'm looking f to try and understand something that I don't know much about, but I'm beginning to hear as some kind of a buzzword, you know, is to try and find organizations that are working on that, whatever it is, and read their website, um, if possible, attend um, some presentation they're doing. So, for example, along those lines, I was able to attend a presentation here in the Bay Area by members of Code Pink uh, a couple of years ago when drones uh, began to kind of um, become more of a household term, if you like. And uh, they were planning to go to do a kind of peace encampment sort of vigil action uh, in Nevada outside one of the bases where the drones are programmed. And so as part of their preparation for that, they had done a lot of very, um, maybe rather basic, but certainly new to me, research on, you know, what drones are, how they work, which companies are making them, both in the United States and in many other countries, how small they are. And also beginning to, you know, ask questions and follow up with stories on uh, what is the effect of sitting there in Nevada and processing these drones that you know if, uh, if your work is successful, you know, will kill people, probably civilians, and then going home at night, you know, to have dinner with your family. Uh, in a way, those people are actually on the front line, but they're not on the front line in the way we usually think about the front line. 
And so that kind of comes back around to our assumptions about what's the front line. And, you know, all the different people who are drawn in in one way or another through their technical skill, maybe they, you know, have very strong technical interests. Um, so I like your point about, um, you know, women sometimes being intimidated by technology. Uh, that was very much the case in part of the conversations we had at Greenham was that, you know, what you needed to know about nuclear weapons, you could write on the back of an envelope and it was not really that uh, complicated. Uh, and, you know, I dare say there's something rather similar about drones. Uh, but I was, I admired Code Pink that they took the lead in, uh, you know, sharing some of the technology that they had researched themselves and, you know, using it as a foundation for their activism. Well, I'd like to ask one more question before we close. Um, and that is, uh, has to do with intuition. Um, because it strikes me that, uh, a lot of what you have both described relies on uh, drawing on one's intuition and uh, one's own intuitive uh, perceptions of things. And um, so my question really has to do with about how one develops that intuitive approach. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, my own thinking is like, well, you listen to it, you listen to your intuition, or you you use it. You know, and when, once you use it, you you get a better, more confidence in it, or you see how it works, or you remember what that voice is like. But I'm wondering uh, if you could each talk a little bit about your your own sense, either in what you've observed in others or in yourselves, about how that um, intuitive approach to to getting a greater understanding of militarism has has worked. Well, I think for me, I've had, I, I like you're using the term, John, developed. I mean, sometimes intuition is used as if it, you're born with it. It's like part of your gene pool, and that's what you're stuck with. Um, but in fact, intuition is kind of a unspoken hunch. And I think sometimes our unspoken hunches are pretty underdeveloped, and we need to look at them really closely and perhaps revise them. So sometimes intuition is gives you a good sense of what you should be questioning more, um, what you should be more skeptical about. But sometimes intuition is something that is woven into what you've come to assume. And in fact, you have to take it out, look at it carefully, talk about it with others, and probably revise it. So intuition is a very... Um, uh, pretty complex and pretty dynamic. I think it is true that oftentimes, particularly with things that are militarized, um, oftentimes one's unmilitarized intuition is such that one is aghast, is stunned, is even embarrassed, but you have the sense that the wider culture has come to accept it, so you don't say anything. Um, and so when you fear, first hear about drones, especially if you can hear about what it's like to live underneath a drone, one's first reaction, maybe intuitive reaction, can be, oh, my God, how awful. Oh, how I can't imagine what it would be like walking down to the subway and having a, knowing there's a drone someplace above, and it's not a friendly drone. <laughs> it's not the traffic helicopter. Um, it's something with weaponry, and it's trying to size up whether I'm a threat or not. And your first reaction, your intuitive reaction is, how horrible. But you've begun to sense that the wider culture, meaning your friends and neighbors, have come to take it as normal, and so you silence your first aghast intuition. And that's a moment at which you should say, whoops. Why am I not expressing how horrifying I think that is or questionable I think that is? And that's a very good moment to say out loud um, what you first found appalling and put it out there because oftentimes it allows other people to say, oh, I'm so glad you said that. I felt the same thing, but my intuition um, was also silenced by my own internal censor, which said, don't say that. You'll sound naive. Uh-huh, uh -huh. right. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, when I hear this question about intuition, my first my first reaction is to go, oh, there goes a woman's intuition again. Um, so my second reaction is to think, you know, I feel so strongly about militarism as a whole system, uh, economically, politically, uh, culturally, and ideologically, that uh, I have to be careful that some of my intuitions don't get in the way of, uh, you know, having a conversation with people. But the other thing I want to, uh, that you kind of made me think about, made me remember, Cynthia, is this whole idea about what's realistic. Mm. And so often we can be involved in a conversation where I think what's happened is people have accepted and unquestioned and assumed so much is unchangeable or is a given about how the the way you know the way this uh, military system works that um if you do oppose it or you act on that intuition you're talking about you know you can be criticized as being unrealistic and i think this is especially true for women who uh, sometimes can be written off that we don't know all about the technology we don't know the throw weights the thrusts you know that this is and that um and so that um, we kind of have to move the discussion to another foundation. Uh, and that's where that, you know, reasserting, oh, how horrible, or that intuition, you're know, bringing things back to a kind of human basis uh, rather than this kind of militarized consciousness, which, as you've pointed out, you know, everybody has to some degree. And, you know, there's a whole field, as you know, of, you know, um, international relations that goes by the name of realism. And uh, I think we really have to question what's realistic about, you know, the way militarism is conducted. And it's not always easy to do that um, without coming across as, um, you know, kind of angry and, and so on. But nevertheless, sometimes I think there is a case of blurting things out. Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> kind of break, you know, some of this kind of silence and self-imposed silence and everybody waiting for somebody else to be the person to bring it up. Because, as you said, especially since September 11th, I think, you know, over a decade now, there's far less space to talk about this stuff openly. Yeah, and you know what, Gwen, when somebody else does the blurting out, it's incumbent upon all of us not to leave her hanging. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and to immediately, even if it's not something you thought about, to immediately come in and say, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Say more. It doesn't mean you have to immediately agree or, you know, you can just immediately say, that's interesting. Say uh -huh. more. To explore that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you, you both, um, I don't know, I kind of perceive it as pushed back a little bit about, uh, the, the liabilities of intuition or the ways in which women are stereotyped as having more intuition. Um, and it, it makes me think about, well, you know, how much of that is my own training as a male uh, to use the, the rational right brain side of myself to the max. Um, and sometimes when I'm constructing a response, like I think about that, that chair with the missing half leg, mm. whoever created that must have relied on some intuitive mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. perception of the impact of landmines. Um, and so sometimes I, I want in, cre in constructing response not only to construct the, quote, realistic, rational response, but to create a response that speaks to people's own intuition. Maybe in order in order that to serve a similar role is like what you're saying is like well let's explore that you know or 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 blurt it out and have someone say well yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that happens when that kind of conversation goes on, I think, John, is that um, rationality gets redefined because being mm -hmm. aghast at a drone is about as realistic as you can be. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, um, I think we're going to close. Is there anything else that either of you want to say in closing? No, I've just had great fun talking to both of you and to all of you who are out there and listening and doing your own work. And be sure and tell Gwen and me what you're up to. How are we going to get smarter if you don't tell us things? 
<laughs> well, we'll be uh, in the in the website where uh, people are streaming this uh, webinar. We will put contact information for both Cynthia and Gwen. So thank you so much for for doing this with us. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Cynthia. Well, thanks, thanks everybody. Sounded great on my end.